Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bounds. Larry Thomas bought a cuckoo clock for his wife, without knowing the price he would have to pay. That night at the dinner table, he brought it out and set it down beside her plate. Doris stared at it, her hand to her mouth. "'My God! What is it?' She looked up at him, bright-eyed. "'Well, open it.' Doris tore the ribbon and paper from the square package with her sharp nails, her bosom rising and falling. Larry stood watching her as she lifted the lid. He lit a cigarette and leaned against the wall. "'A cuckoo clock!' Doris cried. "'A real old cuckoo clock like my mother had!' She turned the clock over and over just like my mother had, when Pete was still alive. Her eyes sparkled with tears. It's made in Germany, Larry said. After a moment, he added, Carl got it for me wholesale. He knows some guy in the clock business. Otherwise, I wouldn't have... He stopped. Doris made a funny little sound. I, I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to afford it, he scowled. What's the matter with you? You've got your clock, haven't you? Isn't that what you want? Doris sat holding onto the clock, her fingers pressed against the brown wood. Well, Larry said, what's the matter? He watched in amazement as she leapt up and ran from the room, still clutching the clock. He shook his head. Never satisfied. They're all that way. Never get enough. He sat down at the table and finished his meal. The cuckoo clock was not very large. It was handmade, however, and there were countless frets on it, little indentations and ornaments scored in the soft wood. Doris sat on the bed, drying her eyes and winding the clock. She set the hands by her wristwatch. Presently, she carefully moved the hands to two minutes of ten. She carried the clock over to the dresser and propped it up. Then she sat waiting, her hands twisted together in her lap, waiting for the cuckoo to come out for the hour to strike. As she sat, she thought about Larry and what he had said. And what she had said, too, for that matter. Not that she could be blamed for any of it. After all, she couldn't keep listening to him forever without defending herself. You had to blow your own trumpet in the world. She touched her handkerchief to her eyes suddenly. Why did he have to say that about getting it wholesale? Why did he have to spoil it all? If he felt that way, he needn't have got it in the first place. She clenched her fists. He was so mean. So damn mean. But she was glad of the little clock sitting there ticking to itself, with its funny grilled edges and the door. Inside the door was the cuckoo, waiting to come out. Was he listening, his head cocked to one side, listening to hear the clock strike so that he would know to come out? Did he sleep between hours? Well, she would soon see him. She could ask him. And she would show the clock to Bob. He would love it. Bob loved old things, even old stamps and buttons. He liked to go with her to the stores. Of course, it was a little awkward, but Larry had been staying at the office so much, and that helped. If only Larry didn't call up sometimes to... There was a whir. The clock shuddered, and all at once the door opened. The cuckoo came out sliding swiftly. He paused and looked around solemnly, scrutinizing her, the room, the furniture. It was the first time he had seen her, she realized, smiling to herself in pleasure. She stood up, coming towards him shyly. Go on, she said. I'm waiting. The cuckoo opened his bill. He whirred and chirped quickly, rhythmically. Then, after a moment of contemplation, he retired and the door snapped shut. She was delighted. She clapped her hands and spun in a little circle. He was marvelous, perfect, and the way he had looked around, studying her, sizing her up. He liked her, she was certain of it. And she, of course, loved him at once, completely. He was just what she had hoped would come out of the little door. Doris went to the clock. She bent over the little door, her lips close to the wood. Do you hear me? she whispered. I think you're the most wonderful cuckoo in the world. She paused, embarrassed. 
I hope you'll like it here. Then she went downstairs again, slowly, her head high. Larry and the cuckoo clock never really got along well from the start. Dora said it was because he didn't wind it right, and it didn't like being only half wound all the time. Larry turned the job of winding over to her. The cuckoo came out every quarter hour and ran the spring down without remorse, and someone had to be ever after it, winding it up again. Doris did her best, but she forgot a good deal of the time. Then Larry would throw his newspaper down with an elaborate weary motion and stand up. He would go into the dining room where the clock was mounted on the wall over the fireplace. He would take the clock down, and, making sure that he had his thumb over the little door, he would wind it up. "'Why do you put your thumb over the door?' Doris asked once. "'You're supposed to.' She raised an eyebrow. "'Are you sure? I wonder if it isn't that you don't want him to come out while you're standing so close.' "'Why not?' "'Maybe you're afraid of him.' Larry laughed. He put the clock back on the wall and gingerly removed his thumb. When Doris wasn't looking, he examined his thumb. There was still a trace of the nick cut out of the soft part of it. Who, or what, had pecked at him? One Saturday morning, when Larry was down at the office working over some important special accounts, Bob Chambers came to the front porch and rang the bell. Doris was taking a quick shower. She dried herself and slipped into her robe. When she opened the door, Bob stepped inside, grinning. "'Hi,' he said, looking around. It's all right. Larry's at the office. Fine. Bob gazed at her slim legs below the hem of the robe. How nice you look today. She laughed. Be careful. Maybe I shouldn't let you in after all. They looked at one another, half amused, half frightened. Presently, Bob said, If you want, I'll... No, for God's sake. She caught hold of his sleeve. Just get out of the doorway so I can close it. Mrs. Peters across the street, you know. She closed the door. And I want to show you something, she said. You haven't seen it. He was interested. An antique? Or what? She took his arm, leading him towards the dining room. You'll love it, Bobby. She stopped, wide-eyed. I hope you will. You must. You must love it. It means so much to me. He means so much. He? Bob frowned. Who is he? Doris laughed. You're jealous. Come on. A moment later, they stood before the clock, looking up at it. He'll come out in a few minutes. Wait until you see him. I know you two will get along just fine. What does Larry think of him? They don't like each other. Sometimes when Larry's here, he won't come out. Larry gets mad if he doesn't come out on time. He says... Says what? Doris looks down. He always says he's been robbed, even if he did get it wholesale. She brightened. But I know he won't come out because he doesn't like Larry. When I'm here alone, he comes right out for me every fifteen minutes, even though he really only has to come out on the hour. She gazed up at the clock. He comes out for me because he wants to. We talk. I tell him things. Of course, I'd like to have him upstairs in my room, but it wouldn't be right. There was the sound of footsteps on the front porch. They looked at each other, horrified. Larry pushed the front door open, grunting. He set his briefcase down and took off his hat. Then he saw Bob for the first time. Chambers, I'll be damned. His eyes narrowed. What are you doing here? He came into the dining room. Doris drew her robe about her helplessly, backing away. I, Bob began, that is, we... He broke off, glancing at Doris. Suddenly, the clock began to whir. The cuckoo came rushing out, bursting into sound. Larry moved towards him. Shut that den off, he said. He raised his fist towards the clock. The cuckoo snapped into silence and retreated. The door closed. That's better. Larry studied Doris and Bob, standing mutely together. I came over to look at the clock, Bob said. Doris told me that it's a rare antique and that... Nuts. I bought it myself. Larry walked up to him. Get out of here. He turned to Doris. You too, and take that damn clock with you. He paused, rubbing his chin. 
No. Leave the clock here. It's mine. I bought it and paid for it. In the weeks that followed after Doris left, Larry and the cuckoo clock got along even worse than before. For one thing, the cuckoo stayed inside most of the time, sometimes even at twelve o'clock when he should have been busiest. And if he did come out at all, he usually spoke only once or twice, never the correct number of times. And there was a sullen, uncooperative note in his voice, a jarring sound that made Larry uneasy and a little angry. But he kept the clock wound because the house was very still and quiet, and it got on his nerves not to hear someone running about, talking and dropping things. And even the whirring of a clock sounded good to him. But he didn't like the cuckoo at all, and sometimes he spoke to him. Listen, he said late one night to the closed little door. I know you can hear me. I ought to give you back to the Germans, back to the Black Forest. He paced back and forth. I wonder what they're doing now, the two of them. That young punk with his books and his antiques. A man shouldn't be interested in antiques. That's for women. He set his jaw. Isn't that right? The clock said nothing. Larry walked up in front of it. Isn't that right? He demanded. Don't you have anything to say? He looked at the face of the clock. It was almost eleven, just a few seconds before the hour. All right. I'll wait until eleven. Then I want to hear what you have to say. You've been pretty quiet the last few weeks since she left. He grinned wryly. Maybe you don't like it here since she's gone. He scowled. Well, I paid for you, and you're coming out whether you like it or not. You hear me? Eleven o'clock came. Far off at the end of town... The great tower clock boomed sleepily to itself, but the little door remained shut. Nothing moved. The minute hand passed on, and the cuckoo did not stir. He was someplace inside the clock, beyond the door, silent and remote. All right, if that's the way you feel, Larry murmured, his lips twisting. But it isn't fair. It's your job to come out. We all have to do things we don't like. He went unhappily into the kitchen and opened the great gleaming refrigerator. As he poured himself a drink, he thought about the clock. There was no doubt about it. The cuckoo should come out, Doris or no Doris. He had always liked her from the very start. They had got along well, the two of them. Probably he liked Bob, too. Probably he had seen enough of Bob to get to know him. They would be quite happy together, Bob and Doris and the cuckoo. Larry finished his drink. He opened the drawer at the sink and took out the hammer. He carried it carefully into the dining room. The clock was ticking gently to itself on the wall. Look, he said, waving the hammer. You know what I have here. You know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to start on you, first, he smiled. Birds of a feather, that's what you are, the three of you. The room was silent. Are you coming out, or do I have to come in and get you? The clock whirred a little. I hear you in there. You've got a lot of talking to do, enough for the last three weeks. As I figure it, you owe me. The door opened. The cuckoo came out fast, straight at him. Larry was looking down, his brow wrinkled in thought. He glanced up, and the cuckoo caught him squarely in the eye. Down he went, hammer and chair and everything, hitting the floor with a tremendous crash. For a moment, the cuckoo paused, its small body poised rigidly. Then it went back inside its house. The door snapped tight shut after it. The man lay on the floor, stretched out grotesquely, his head bent over to one side. Nothing moved or stirred. The room was completely silent, except, of course, for the ticking of the clock. "'I see,' Doris said, her face tight. Bob put his arm around her, steadying her. "'Doctor,' Bob said. Can I ask you something? Of course, the doctor said. 
Is it very easy to break your neck falling from so low a chair? It wasn't very far to fall. I wonder if it might not have been an accident. Is there any chance it might have been... Suicide? The doctor rubbed his jaw. I never heard of anyone committing suicide that way. It was an accident, I'm positive. I don't mean suicide, Bob murmured under his breath, looking up at the clock on the wall. I meant... something else. But no one heard him. End of Beyond the Door by Philip K. Dick The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman The Black Cat For the most wild, yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it, in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad am I not, and very surely do I not dream. But to-morrow I die, and to-day I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me they have presented little but horror. To many they will seem less terrible than Baroque's. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some intellect more calm, more logical, and far less excitable than my own, which will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derivable. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early, and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity of procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black, and sagacious to an astonishing degree. 
in speaking of his intelligence my wife who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise not that she was ever serious upon this point and i mention the matter at all for no better reason than that it happens just now to be remembered pluto this was the cat's name was my favorite pet and playmate i alone fed him and he attended me wherever i went about the house it was even with difficulty that i could prevent him from following me through the streets our friendship lasted in this manner for several years during which my general temperament and character through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance had i blush to confess it experienced a radical alteration for the worse i grew day by day more moody more irritable more regardless of the feelings of others i suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife at length i even offered her personal violence my pets of course were made to feel the change in my disposition i not only neglected but ill-used them for pluto however i still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him as i made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits the monkey or even the dog when by accident or through affection they came in my way but my disease grew upon me for what disease is like alcohol and at length even pluto who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish even pluto began to experience the effects of my ill temper one night returning home much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town i fancied that the cat avoided my presence i seized him when in his fright at my violence he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth the fury of a demon instantly possessed me i knew myself no longer my original soul seemed at once to take its flight from my body and a more than fiendish malevolence gin nurtured thrilled every fibre of my frame i took from my waistcoat pocket a penknife opened it grasped the poor beast by the throat and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket i blush i burn i shudder while i pen the damnable atrocity when reason returned with the morning when i had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch i experienced a sentiment half of horror half of remorse for the crime of which i had been guilty but it was at best a feeble and equivocal feeling and the soul remained untouched i again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed in the meantime the cat slowly recovered the socket of the lost eye presented it is true a frightful appearance but he no longer appeared to suffer any pain he went about the house as usual but as might be expected fled in extreme terror at my approach i had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me but this feeling soon gave place to irritation and then came as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow the spirit of perverseness 
of this spirit philosophy takes no account. Yet I am not more sure that my soul lives than I am that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties or sentiments which give direction to the character of man. Who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination, in the teeth of our best judgment, to violate that which is law, merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for the wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning in cold blood I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse in my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me, and because I felt it had given me no reason of offence, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin, that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames, the whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity but I am detailing a chain of facts, and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to its having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd were collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. The words, strange, singular, and other similar expressions excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas-relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvellous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme, but at length reflection came to my aid. 
The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd, by some one of whom the animal must have been cut from the tree and thrown through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not the less fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat, and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented, for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, with which to supply its place. One night, as I sat half stupefied in a den of more than infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to some black object reposing upon the head of one of the immense hogsheads of gin or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of the apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this hogshead for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it, and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home, the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just a reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not for some weeks strike or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, 
and to flee silently from its odious presence, as from the breath of a pestilence. What added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I have already said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait, and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair, or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet, and thus nearly throw me down, or, fastening its long and sharp claws in my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from so doing, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell, I am almost ashamed to own, that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this above all I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. Oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death! And now was I indeed wretched, beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast, whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man fashioned in the image of the high God, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear, to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face, and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, 
the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed evil thoughts became my sole intimates the darkest and most evil of thoughts the moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind while from the sudden frequent and ungovernable outburst of a fury to which i now blindly abandoned myself my uncomplaining wife alas was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers one day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit the cat followed me down the steep stairs and nearly throwing me headlong exasperated me to madness uplifting an axe and forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand i aimed a blow at the animal which of course would have proved instantly fatal had it descended as i wished but this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife goaded by the interference into a rage more than demoniacal i withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain she fell dead upon the spot without a groan this hideous murder accomplished i set myself forthwith and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body i knew that i could not remove it from the house either by day or by night without the risk of being observed by their neighbours many projects entered my mind at one period i thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire at another i resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar again i deliberated about casting it in the well in the yard about packing it in a box as if merchandise with the usual arrangements and so getting a porter to take it from the house finally i hit upon what i considered a far better expedient than either of these i determined to wall it up in the cellar as the monks of the middle ages are recorded to have walled up their victims for a purpose such as this the cellar was well adapted its walls were loosely constructed and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening moreover in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the red of the cellar i made no doubt that i could readily displace the bricks at this point insert the corpse and wall the hole up as before so that no eye could detect anything suspicious and in this calculation i was not deceived by means of a crowbar i easily dislodged the bricks and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall i propped it in that position while with little trouble i relayed the whole structure as it originally stood having procured mortar sand and hair with every possible precaution i prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old and with this i very carefully went over the new brickwork when i had finished i felt satisfied that all was right the wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed the rubbish on the floor was picked up with the minutest care i looked around triumphantly and said to myself here at least then my labor has not been in vain my next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness for i had at length firmly resolved to put it to death 
Had I been able to meet with it at the moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate. But it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger, and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for one night at least, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept. I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and the third day passed and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a freeman. The monster in terror had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. Even a search had been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as secured. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came very unexpectedly into the house, and proceeded again to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure, however, in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat calmly, as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom, and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee at my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say, if but one word, by way of triumph and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. "'Gentlemen,' I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, "'I delight to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health and a little more courtesy. By the by, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house.' In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered at all. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. And here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily with a cane which I held in my hand upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of the wife of my bosom. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend! No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony, and of the demons that exult in the damnation. Of my own thoughts it is folly to speak. Swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant 
the party upon the stairs remained motionless through extremity of terror and of awe in the next a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall it fell bodily the corpse already greatly decayed and clotted with gore stood erect before the eyes of the spectators upon its head with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire sat the hideous beast whose craft had seduced me into murder and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman i had walled the monster up within the tomb end of the black cat by edgar allan poe recording by ron altman the boarded window by ambrose bierce recorded by tony scheinman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Boarded Window by Ambrose Bierce In 1830, only a few miles away from what is now the great city of Cincinnati, lay an immense and almost unbroken forest. The whole region was sparsely settled by people of the frontier, restless souls who no sooner had hewn fairly habitable homes out of the wilderness and attained to that degree of prosperity which to-day we should call indigence then impelled by some mysterious impulse of their nature they abandoned all and pushed farther westward to encounter new perils and privations in the effort to regain the meagre comforts which they had voluntarily renounced many of them had already forsaken that region for the remoter settlements but among those remaining was one who had been of those first arriving. He lived alone in a house of logs, surrounded on all sides by the great forest, of whose gloom and silence he seemed a part, for no one had ever known him to smile, nor speak a needless word. His simple wants were supplied by the sale or barter of skins of wild animals in the river town, for not a thing did he grow upon the land which, if needful, he might have claimed by right of undisturbed possession there were evidences of improvement a few acres of ground immediately about the house had once been cleared of its trees the decayed stumps of which were half concealed by the new growth that had been suffered to repair the ravage wrought by the axe apparently the man's zeal for agriculture had burned with a failing flame expiring in penitential ashes the little log house with its chimney of sticks its roof of warping clapboards weighted with traversing poles, and its chinking of clay, had a single door, and, directly opposite, a window. The latter, however, was boarded up. Nobody could remember a time when it was not. And none knew why it was so closed, certainly not because of the occupant's dislike of light and air, for on those rare occasions when a hunter had passed that lonely spot, the recluse had commonly been seen sunning himself on his doorstep, if heaven had provided sunshine for his need. I fancy there are few persons living to-day who ever knew the secret of that window. But I am one, as you shall see. The man's name was said to be Murlock. He was apparently seventy years old, actually about fifty. Something besides years had had a hand in his aging. His hair and long full beard were white, his grey, lustreless eyes sunken, his face singularly seamed with wrinkles which appeared to belong to two intersecting systems. In figure he was tall and spare, with a stoop of the shoulders, a burden-bearer. I never saw him. These particulars I learned from my grandfather, from whom also I got the man's story when I was a lad. He had known him when living nearby in that early day. One day— Murlock was found in his cabin, dead. It was not a time and place for coroners and newspapers, and I suppose it was agreed that he had died from natural causes, or I should have been told, and should remember. I know only that with what was probably a sense of the fitness of things, 
The body was buried near the cabin, alongside the grave of his wife, who had preceded him by so many years that local tradition had retained hardly a hint of her existence. That closes the final chapter of this true story, excepting, indeed, the circumstance which many years afterward, in company with an equally intrepid spirit, I penetrated to the place, and ventured near enough to the ruined cabin to throw a stone against it, and ran away to avoid the ghost which every well-informed boy thereabout knew haunted the spot. But there is an earlier chapter, that supplied by my grandfather. When Murlock built his cabin and began laying sturdily about with his axe to hew out a farm, the rifle meanwhile his means of support, he was young, strong, and full of hope. In that eastern country whence he came, he had married, as was the fashion, a young woman in all ways worthy of his honest devotion, who shared the dangers and privations of his lot with a willing spirit and light heart. There is no known record of her name. Of her charms of mind and person, tradition is silent, and the doubter is at liberty to entertain his doubt, but God forbid that I should share it. Of their affection and happiness there is abundant assurance in every added day of the man's widowed life. For what but the magnetism of a blessed memory could have chained that venturesome spirit to a lot like that? One day Murlock returned from gunning in a distant part of the forest to find his wife prostrate with fever and delirious. There was no physician within miles, no neighbor, nor was she in a condition to be left to summon help. So he set about the task of nursing her back to health. But at the end of the third day she fell into unconsciousness, and so passed away, apparently, with never a gleam of returning reason. From what we know of a nature like his, we may venture to sketch in some of the details of the outline picture drawn by my grandfather. When convinced that she was dead, Murlock had sense enough to remember that the dead must be prepared for burial. In performance of this sacred duty he blundered now and again, did certain things incorrectly, and others which he did correctly were done over and over. His occasional failures to accomplish some simple and ordinary act filled him with astonishment, like that of a drunken man who wonders at the suspension of familiar natural laws. He was surprised, too, that he did not weep, surprised and a little ashamed. Surely it is unkind not to weep for the dead. "'Tomorrow,' he said aloud, "'I shall have to make the coffin and dig the grave, and then I shall miss her when she is no longer in sight. But now she is dead, of course, but it is all right. It must be all right somehow. Things cannot be so bad as they seem.' He stood over the body in the fading light, adjusting the hair and putting the finishing touches to the simple toilet, doing all mechanically with soulless care. And still through his consciousness ran an undersense of conviction that all was right, that he should have her again as before, and everything explained. He had had no experience in grief. His capacity had not been enlarged by use. His heart could not contain it all, nor his imagination rightly conceive it. He did not know he was so hard-struck. That knowledge would come later, and never grow. Grief is an artist of powers as various as the instruments upon which he plays his dirges for the dead, evoking from some the sharpest, shrillest notes, from others the low, grave chords that throb recurrent, like the slow beating of a distant drum. Some natures it startles, some it stupefies. To one it comes like the stroke of an arrow, stinging all the sensibilities to a keener life, to another as the blow of a bludgeon, which in crushing benumbs. We may conceive Murlock to have been that way affected, for, and here we are upon surer ground than that of conjecture, no sooner had he finished his pious work than, sinking into a chair by the side of the table upon which the body lay, and noting how white the profile showed in the deepening gloom, he laid his arms upon the table's edge, and dropped his face into them, tearless yet, and unutterably weary. At that moment came in through the open window a long, wailing sound, like the cry of a lost child in the far deeps of the darkening wood. But the man did not move. Again, and nearer than before, sounded that unearthly cry upon his failing sense. Perhaps it was a wild beast. 
Perhaps it was a dream, for Murloc was asleep. Some hours later, as it afterward appeared, this unfaithful watcher awoke, and, lifting his head from his arms, intently listened. He knew not why. There, in the black darkness by the side of the dead, recalling all without a shock, he strained his eyes to see. He knew not what. His senses were all alert. His breath was suspended. His blood had stilled its tides as if to assist the silence. Who, what, had waked him? And where was it? Suddenly the table shook beneath his arms, and at the same moment he heard, or fancied that he heard, a light, soft step. Another. Sounds as of bare feet upon the floor. He was terrified beyond the power to cry out or move. Perforce he waited, waited there in the darkness, through seeming centuries of such dread as one may know, yet live to tell. He tried vainly to speak the dead woman's name, vainly to stretch forth his hand across the table to learn if she were there. His throat was powerless. His arms and hands were like lead. Then occurred something most frightful. Some heavy body seemed hurled against the table with an impetus that pushed it against his breast so sharply as nearly to overthrow him, and at the same instant he heard and felt the fall of something upon the floor with so violent a thump that the whole house was shaken by the impact. A scuffling ensued, and a confusion of sounds impossible to describe. Murlock had risen to his feet. Fear had by excess forfeited control of his faculties. He flung his hands upon the table. Nothing was there. There is a point at which terror may turn to madness, and madness incites to action. With no definite intent, from no motive but the wayward impulse of a madman, Murlock sprang to the wall, with a little groping seized his loaded rifle, and without aim discharged it. By the flash which lit up the room with a vivid illumination, he saw an enormous panther dragging the dead woman toward the window, its teeth fixed in her throat. Then there were darkness blacker than before, and silence. And when he returned to consciousness, the sun was high, and the wood vocal with songs of birds. The body lay near the window, where the beast had left it when frightened away by the flash and report of the rifle. The clothing was deranged, the long hair in disorder, the limbs lay anyhow. From the throat, dreadfully lacerated, had issued a pool of blood not yet entirely coagulated. The ribbon with which he had bound the wrists was broken, the hands were tightly clenched. Between the teeth was a fragment of the animal's ear. End of The Boarded Window by Ambrose Bierce A Case of Identity by Arthur Conan Doyle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Case of Identity my dear fellow said sherlock holmes as we sat on either side of the fire in his lodgings at baker street life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man can invent we would not dare to conceive the things which are really mere commonplaces of existence if we could fly out of that window hand in hand hover over this great city gently remove the roofs and peep in at the queer things which are going on the strange coincidences the plannings, the cross-purposes, the wonderful chains of events, working through generations and leading to the most outré results, it would make all fiction, with its conventionalities and foreseen conclusions, most stale and unprofitable. "'And yet I am not convinced of it,' I answered. "'The cases which come to light in the papers are, as a rule, bold enough, and vulgar enough.' We have in our police reports realism pushed to its extreme limits, and yet the result is, it must be confessed, neither fascinating nor artistic. A certain selection and discretion must be used in producing a realistic effect, remarked Holmes. This is wanting in the police report, where more stress is laid perhaps upon the platitudes of the magistrate than upon the details, which to an observer contain the vital essence of the whole matter. Depend upon it, there is nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. I smiled and shook my head. I can quite understand your thinking so, I said. 
of course in your position of unofficial adviser and helper to everybody who is absolutely puzzled throughout three continents you are brought in contact with all that is strange and bizarre but here i picked up the morning paper from the ground let us put it to a practical test here is the first heading upon which i come a husband's cruelty to his wife there is half a column of print but i know without reading it that it is all perfectly familiar to me there is of course the other woman the drink the push the blow the bruise the unsympathetic sister or landlady the crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude indeed your example is an unfortunate one for your argument said holmes taking the paper and glancing his eye down it this is the dunder separation case and as it happens i was engaged in clearing up some small points in connection with it the husband was a teetotaler and there was no other woman and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife which you will allow is not an action likely to occur in the imagination of the average story-teller take a pinch of snuff doctor and acknowledge that i have scored over you in your example he held out his snuff-box of old gold with a great amethyst in the centre of the lid its splendour was in such contrast to his homely ways and simple life that i could not help commenting upon it ah said he i forgot that i had not seen you for some weeks it is a little souvenir from the king of bohemia in return for my assistance in the case of the arline adler papers and the ring i asked glancing at a remarkable brilliant which sparkled upon his finger it was from the reigning family of holland though the matter in which i served them was of such delicacy that i cannot confide it even to you who have been good enough to chronicle one or two of my little problems and have you any on hand just now i asked with interest some ten or twelve but none which present any features of interest they are important you understand without being interesting indeed i have found that it is usually in unimportant matters that there is a field for the observation and for the quick analysis of cause and effect which gives the charm to an investigation the larger crimes are apt to be the simpler for the bigger the crime the more obvious as a rule is the motive in these cases save for one rather intricate matter which has been referred to me from marseilles there is nothing which presents any features of interest it is possible however that i may have something better before very many minutes are over for this is one of my clients or i am much mistaken he had risen from his chair and was standing between the parted blinds gazing down into the dull neutral tinted london street looking over his shoulder i saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a large woman with a heavy fur boa round her neck and a large curling red feather in a broad-brimmed hat which was tilted in a coquettish duchess of devonshire fashion over her ear from under this great panoply she peered up in a nervous hesitating fashion at our windows while her body oscillated backward and forward and her fingers fidgeted with her gloved buttons suddenly with a plunge as of the swimmer who leaves the bank she hurried across the road and we heard the sharp clang of the bell i've seen those symptoms before said holmes throwing his cigarette into the fire oscillation upon the pavement always means an affaire de coeur she would like advice but is not sure that the matter is not too delicate for communication and yet even here we may discriminate when a woman has been seriously wronged by a man she no longer oscillates and the usual symptom is a broken bell-wire here we may take it that there is a love matter but that the maiden is not so much angry as perplexed or grieved and here she comes in person to resolve our doubts as he spoke there was a tap at the door and the boy in buttons entered to announce miss mary sutherland while the lady herself loomed behind his small black figure like a full-sailed merchantman behind a tiny pilot-boat sherlock holmes welcomed her with the easy courtesy for which he was remarkable and having closed the door and bowed her into an armchair he looked her over in the minute and yet abstracted fashion which was peculiar to him do you not find he said that with your short sight it is a little trying to do so much typewriting 
"'I did at first, she answered. "'But now I know where the letters are without looking.' "'Then, suddenly realising the full purport of his words, "'she gave a violent start and looked up with fear and astonishment "'upon her broad, good-humoured face. "'You've heard about me, Mr. Holmes,' she cried. "'Else how could you know all that?' "'Never mind,' said Holmes, laughing. "'It is my business to know things. "'Perhaps I have trained myself to see what others overlook. "'If not, why should you come to consult me?' "'I came to see you, sir, because I heard of you from Mrs. Etheridge, "'whose husband you found so easily when the police and everyone had given him up for dead. "'Oh, Mr. Holmes, I wish you would do as much for me. "'I'm not rich.' "'but still I have a hundred a year in my own right, "'besides a little that I make by the machine, "'and I would give it all to know what has become of Mr. Hosmer Angel.' "'Why did you come away to consult me in such a hurry?' "'asked Sherlock Holmes, with his fingertips together "'and his eyes to the ceiling. "'Again a startled look came over the somewhat vacuous face "'of Miss Mary Sutherland. "'Yes, I did bang out of the house,' she said, for it made me angry to see the easy way in which Mr. Windybank, that is, my father, took it all. He would not go to the police, and he would not go to you, and so at least, as he would do nothing, and kept on saying that there was no harm done, it made me mad, and I just on with my things and came right away to you. "'Your father?' said Holmes. "'Your stepfather, surely, since the name is different?' "'Yes, my stepfather.' I call him father, though it sounds funny, too, for he is only five years and two months older than myself. And your mother is alive? Oh, yes, mother is alive and well. I wasn't best pleased, Mr. Holmes, when she married again so soon after father's death, and a man who was nearly fifteen years younger than herself. Father was a plumber in the Tottenham Court Road, and he left a tidy business behind him, which mother carried on with Mr. Hardy, the foreman. But when Mr. Windybank came, he made her sell the business, for he was very superior, being a traveller in wines. They got 4700 for the goodwill and interest, which wasn't near as much as father could have got if he had been alive. I had expected to see Sherlock Holmes impatient under this rambling and inconsequential narrative, but on the contrary he had listened with the greatest concentration of attention. "'Your own little income?' he asked. "'Does it come out of the business?' "'Oh, no, sir. It is quite separate, and was left me by my Uncle Ned in Auckland. "'It is in New Zealand stock, paying four and a half per cent. Two thousand five hundred pounds was the amount, but I can only touch the interest.' "'You interest me extremely,' said Holmes. "'And since you draw so large a sum as a hundred a year, with what you earn into the bargain,' You no doubt travel a little and indulge yourself in every way. I believe that a single lady can get on very nicely upon an income of about sixty pounds. I could do with much less than that, Mr. Holmes, but you understand that as long as I live at home, I don't wish to be a burden on them, and so they have the use of the money just while I am staying with them. Of course, that is only just for the time. Mr. Windybank draws my interest every quarter and pays it over to Mother and I find that I can do pretty well with what I earn at typewriting. It brings me tuppence a sheet, and I can often do from fifteen to twenty sheets in a day. "'You have made your position very clear to me,' said Holmes. "'This is my friend, Dr. Watson, before whom you can speak as freely as before myself. Kindly tell us now all about your connection with Mr. Hosmer Angel.' A flush stole over Miss Sutherland's face, and she picked nervously, at the fringe of her jacket i met him first at the gasfitters ball she said they used to send father tickets when he was alive and then afterwards they remembered us and sent them to mother mr windybank did not wish to go he never did wish to go anywhere he would get quite mad if i wanted so much as to join a sunday school treat but this time i was set on going and i would go for what right had he to prevent he said the folk were not fit for us to know, when all father's friends were to be there, and he said that I had nothing fit to wear, when I had my purple plush that I had never so much as taken out of the drawer. At last, when nothing else would do, he went off to France upon the business of the firm, but we went, mother and I, with Mr. Hardy, who used to be our foreman, 
and it was there I met Mr. Hosmer Angel. "'I suppose,' said Holmes, "'that when Mr. Windybank came back from France, "'he was very annoyed at your having gone to the ball. "'Oh, well, he was very good about it. "'He laughed, I remember, and shrugged his shoulders, "'and said there was no use denying anything to a woman, "'for she would have her way. "'I see. "'Then at the Gasfitter's Ball you met, as I understand, "'a gentleman called Mr. Hosmer Angel.' "'Yes, sir. I met him that night, and he called next day to ask if we had got home all safe, and after that we met him. That is to say, Mr. Holmes, I met him twice for walks, but after that father came back again, and Mr. Hosmer Angel could not come to the house any more. No? Well, you know, father didn't like anything of the sort. He wouldn't have visitors if he could help it, and he used to say that a woman should be happy in her own family circle. But then, as I used to say to mother, a woman wants her own circle to begin with, and I had not got mine yet. But how about Mr. Hosmer Angel? Did he make no attempts to see you? Well, father was going off to France again in a week, and Hosmer wrote and said that it would be safer and better not to see each other until he had gone. We could write in the meantime, and he used to write every day. I took the letters in the morning, so there was no need for father to know. "'Were you engaged to the gentleman at this time?' "'Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. "'We were engaged after the first walk that we took. "'Hosmer, Mr. Angel, was a cashier in an office in Lednall Street, "'and what office?' "'That's the worst of it, Mr. Holmes. "'I don't know. "'Where did he live, then? "'He slept on the premises. "'And you don't know his address?' "'No, except it was in Lednall Street.' "'Where did you address your letters, then?' "'To the Lednall Street Post Office, to be left till called for. "'He said if they were sent to the office he would be chaffed by all the other clerks "'about having letters from a lady. "'So I offered to typewrite them, like he did his. "'But he wouldn't have that, for he said that when I wrote them they seemed to come from me. "'But when they were typewritten he always felt that the machine had come between us. "'That will just show you how fond he was of me, Mr. Holmes.' and the little things that he would think of. "'It was most suggestive,' said Holmes. "'It has long been an axiom of mine that the little things are infinitely the most important. Can you remember any other little things about Mr. Hosmer Angel?' "'He was a very shy man, Mr. Holmes. He would rather walk with me in the evening than in the daylight, for he said that he hated to be conspicuous. Very retiring and gentlemanly he was, even his voice was gentle. He had the quincy and swollen glands when he was young, he told me, and it had left him with a weak throat and a hesitating, whispering fashion of speech. He was always well-dressed, very neat and plain, but his eyes were weak, just as mine are, and he wore tinted glasses against the glare. Well, and what happened when Mr. Windybank, your stepfather, returned from France? Mr. Hosmer Angel came to the house again, and proposed that we should marry before father came back. He was in dreadful earnest, and made me swear with my hands on the testament that whatever happened I would always be true to him. Mother said he was quite right to make me swear, and that it was a sign of his passion. Mother was all in his favour from the first, and was even fonder of him than I was. Then, when they talked of marrying within the week, I began to ask about father, but they both said never to mind about father, but just tell him afterwards, and mother said she would make it all right with him. I didn't quite like that, Mr. Holmes. It seemed funny that I should ask his leave, as he was only a few years older than me, but I didn't want to do anything on the sly. So I wrote to father in Bordeaux, where the company has its French offices, but the letter came back to me on the very morning of the wedding. It missed him, then? Yes, sir for he started to England just before it arrived. Ha! Huh, that was unfortunate. Your wedding was arranged, then, for the Friday. Was it to be in church? Yes, sir, but very quietly. It was to be at St. Saviour's, near King's Cross, and we were to have breakfast afterwards at the St. Pancras Hotel. Hosmer came for us in a hansom, but as there were two of us, he put us both into it and stepped himself into a four-wheeler, which happened to be the only other cab in the street. 
we got to the church first and when the four-wheeler drove up we waited for him to step out but he never did and when the cabman got down from the box and looked there was no one there the cabman said that he could not imagine what had become of him for he had seen him get in with his own eyes that was last friday mr holmes and i have never seen or heard anything since then to throw any light upon what became of him it seems to me that you have been shamefully treated said holmes oh no sir he was too good and kind to leave me so why all the morning he was saying to me that whatever happened i was to be true and that even if something quite unforeseen occurred to separate us i was always to remember that i was plighted to him and that he would claim his pledge sooner or later it seems strange talk for a wedding morning but what has happened since gives a meaning to it most certainly it does your own opinion is then that some unforeseen catastrophe has occurred to him yes sir i believe that he foresaw some danger or else he would not have talked so and then i think that what he foresaw happened but you have no notion as to what it could have been none one more question how did your mother take the matter she was angry and said that i was never to speak of the matter again and your father did you tell him yes and he seemed to think with me that something had happened and that i should hear of hosmer again as he said what interest could any one have in bringing me to the door of the church and then leaving me now if he had borrowed my money or if he had married me and got my money settled on him there might be some reason but hosmer was very independent about money and never would look at a shilling of mine and yet what could have happened and why could he not write oh it drives me half mad to think of and i can't sleep a wink at night she pulled a little handkerchief out of her muff and began to sob heavily into it i shall glance into the case for you said holmes rising and i have no doubt that we shall reach some definite result let the weight of the matter rest upon me now and do not let your mind dwell upon it further above all try to let mr hosmer angel vanish from your memory as he has done from your life then you don't think i'll see him again i fear not then what has happened to him you will leave that question in my hands i should like an accurate description of him and any letters of his which you can spare i advertised for him in last saturday's chronicle said she here is the slip and here are four letters from him thank you and your address number thirty one lion place camberwell mr angel's address you never had i understand where is your father's place of business he travels for west house and marbank the great claret importers of fenchurch street thank you you have made your statement very clearly you will leave the papers here and remember the advice which i have given you let the whole incident be a sealed book and do not allow it to affect your life you are very kind mr holmes but i cannot do that i shall be true to hosmer he shall find me ready when he comes back for all the preposterous hat and the vacuous face there was something noble in the simple faith of our visitor which compelled our respect she laid her little bundle of papers upon the table and went her way with a promise to come again whenever she might be summoned sherlock holmes sat silent for a few minutes with his fingertips still pressed together his legs stretched out in front of him and his gaze directed upward to the ceiling then he took down from the rack the old and oily clay pipe which was to him as a counsellor and having lighted it he leaned back in his chair with thick blue cloud wreaths spinning up from him and a look of infinite languor in his face quite an interesting study that maiden he observed i found her more interesting than her little problem which by the way is rather a trite one you will find parallel cases if you consult my index in andover in seventy seven and there was something of that sort at the hague last year old as is the idea however there were one or two details which were new to me but the maiden herself was most instructive you appeared to read a good deal upon her which was quite invisible to me i remarked 
not invisible but unnoticed watson you did not know where to look and so you missed all that was important i can never bring you to realize the importance of sleeves the suggestiveness of thumbnails or the great issues that may hang from a bootlace now what did you gather from the woman's appearance describe it well she had a slate-coloured broad-brimmed straw hat with a feather of brickish red her jacket was black with black beads sewed upon it and a fringe of little black jet ornaments her dress was brown rather darker than coffee colour with a little purple plush at the neck and sleeves her gloves were greyish and were worn through on the right forefinger her boots i didn't observe she had small round hanging gold earrings and a general air of being fairly well-to-do in a vulgar comfortable easy-going way sherlock holmes clapped his hands softly together and chuckled upon my word watson you are coming along wonderfully you have really done very well indeed it is true that you have missed everything of importance but you have hit upon the method and you have a quick eye for colour never trust to general impressions my boy but concentrate yourself upon details my first glance is always at a woman's sleeve in a man it is perhaps better first to take the knee of the trouser as you observe this woman had plush upon her sleeve which is the most useful material for showing traces the double line a little above the wrist where the typewriter presses against the table was beautifully defined the sewing machine of the hand type leaves a similar mark but only on the left arm and on the side of it farthest from the thumb instead of being right across the broadest part as this was i then glanced at her face and observing the dint of a pince-nez at either side of her nose i ventured a remark upon her short sight and typewriting which seemed to surprise her it surprised me but surely it was very obvious i was then very much surprised and interested on glancing down to observe that though the boots which she was wearing were not unlike each other they were really odd ones the one having a slightly decorated toe-cap and the other a plain one one was buttoned only in the two lower buttons out of five and the other at the first third and fifth now when you see that a young lady otherwise neatly dressed has come away from home with odd boots half buttoned it is no great deduction to say that she came away in a hurry and what else i asked keenly interested as i always was by my friend's incisive reasoning i noticed in passing that she had written a note before leaving home but after being fully dressed you observed that her right glove was torn at the forefinger but you did not apparently see that both glove and finger were stained with violet ink she had written in a hurry and dipped her pen too deep it must have been this morning or the mark would not remain clear upon the finger all well, this is amusing though rather elementary but i must go back to business watson would you mind reading me the advertised description of mr hosmer angel i held the little printed slip to the light missing it said on the morning of the fourteenth a gentleman named hosmer angel about five feet seven inches in height strongly built sallow complexion black hair a little bold in the centre bushy black side whiskers and moustache tinted glasses slight infirmity of speech was dressed when last seen in black frock coat faced with silk black waistcoat gold albert chain and grey harris tweed trousers with brown gaiters over elastic sided boots known to have been employed in an office in leadenhall street anybody bringing etc etc that will do said holmes as to the letters he continued glancing over them they are very commonplace absolutely no clue in them to mr angel save that he quotes balzac once there is one remarkable point however which would no doubt strike you they are typewritten i remarked not only that but the signature is typewritten look at the neat little hosmer angel at the bottom there is a date you see but no superscription except leadenhall street which is rather vague the point about the signature is very suggestive in fact we may call it conclusive of what my dear fellow is it possible that you do not see how strongly it bears upon the case 
"'I cannot say that I do, unless it were that he wished to be able to deny his signature if an action for breach of promise were instituted. "'No, that was not the point. However, I shall write two letters which should settle the matter. One is to a firm in the city, the other is to the young lady's stepfather, Mr. Windybank, asking him whether he could meet us here at six o'clock tomorrow evening. It is just as well that we should do business with the male relatives. And now, doctor, we can do nothing until the answers to those letters come, so we may put our little problem upon the shelf for the interim. I had had so many reasons to believe in my friend's subtle powers of reasoning and extraordinary energy in action, that I felt he must have some solid grounds for the assured and easy demeanour with which he treated the singular mystery which he had been called upon to fathom. Only once had I known him to fail, in the case of the King of Bohemia and the Irene Adler photograph, but when I looked back to the weird business of the sign of the four, and the extraordinary circumstances connected with the study in Scarlet, I felt that it would be a strange tangle indeed, which he could not unravel. I left him then, still puffing at his black clay pipe, with the conviction that when I came again on the next morning, I would find that he held in his hands all the clues which would lead up to the identity of the disappearing bridegroom of Miss Mary Sutherland. A professional case of great gravity was engaging my own attention at the time, and the whole of next day I was busy at the bedside of the sufferer. It was not until close upon six o'clock that I found myself free, and was able to spring into a hansom and drive to Baker Street, half afraid that I might be too late to assist in the denouement of the little mystery. I found Sherlock Holmes alone, however, half asleep, with his long, thin form curled up in the recesses of his armchair. A formidable array of bottles and test-tubes, with the pungent, cleanly smell of hydrochloric acid, told me that he had spent his day in the chemical work which was so dear to him. "'Well, have you solved it?' I asked as I entered. "'Yes, it was the bisulfate of barita. "'No, no, the mystery!' I cried. "'Oh, that! I thought of the salt that I had been working upon. "'There was never any mystery in the matter, though, as I said yesterday, "'some of the details are of interest. "'The only drawback is there is no law, I fear, that can touch the scoundrel. "'Who was he, then, and what was his object in deserting Miss Sutherland?' The question was hardly out of my mouth, and Holmes had not yet opened his lips to reply, when we heard a heavy footfall in the passage and a tap at the door. "'This is the girl's stepfather, Mr. James Windybank,' said Holmes. "'He has written to me to say that he will be here at six. "'Come in!' The man who entered was a sturdy, middle-sized fellow some thirty years of age, clean-shaven and sallow-skinned, with a bland, insinuating manner and a pair of wonderfully sharp and penetrating grey eyes. He shot a questioning glance at each of us, placed his shiny top hat on the sideboard, and, with a slight bow, sidled down into the nearest chair. "'Good evening, Mr. James Windybank,' said Holmes. "'I think this typewritten letter is from you, in which you made an appointment with me for six o'clock.' "'Yes, sir, I am afraid that I am a little late, but I am not quite my own master, you know.' "'I am sorry that Miss Sutherland has troubled you about this little matter, "'for I think it is far better not to wash linen of that sort in public. "'It was quite against my wishes that she came, "'but she is a very excitable, impulsive girl, as you might have noticed, "'and she is not easily controlled when she has made up her mind on a point. "'Of course I did not mind you so much, as you are not connected with the official police, "'but it is not pleasant to have family misfortune like this noised abroad.' "'Besides, it is a useless expense, for how could you possibly find this Hosmer angel?' "'On the contrary,' said Holmes quietly, "'I have every reason to believe that I will succeed in discovering Mr. Hosmer angel.' Mr. Windybank gave a violent start and dropped his gloves. "'I am delighted to hear it,' he said. "'It is a curious thing,' remarked Holmes, "'that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting.' Unless they are quite new, no two of them write exactly alike. Some letters get more worn than others, and some wear only on one side. Now you remark in this note of yours, Mr. Windybank, that in every case there is some slurring over the E, and a slight defect in the tail of the R. There are fourteen other characteristics, but those are the more obvious. 
we do all our correspondence with this machine at the office and no doubt it is a little worn our visitor answered glancing keenly at holmes with his bright little eyes and now i will show you what is really a very interesting study mr windybank holmes continued i think of writing another little monograph some of these days on the typewriter and its relation to crime it is a subject to which i have devoted some little attention i have here four letters which purport to come from the missing man they are all typewritten in each case not only are the e slurred and the r's tailless but you will observe if you care to use my magnifying lens that the fourteen other characteristics to which i have alluded are there as well mr windybank sprang out of his chair and picked up his hat i cannot waste time over this sort of fantastic talk mr holmes he said if you can catch the man catch him and let me know when you have done it certainly said holmes stepping over and turning the key in the door i let you know then that i have caught him what where shouted mr windybank turning white to his lips and glancing about him like a rat in a trap oh it won't do really it won't said holmes suavely there is no possible getting out of it mr windybank it is quite too transparent and it was a very bad compliment when you said that it was impossible for me to solve so simple a question that's right sit down and let us talk it over our visitor collapsed into a chair with a ghastly face and a glitter of moisture on his brow it's it's not actionable he stammered i'm very much afraid that it is not but between ourselves windybank it was a cruel and selfish and heartless a trick in a petty way as ever came before me now let me just run over the course of events and you will contradict me if i go wrong the man sat huddled in his chair with his head sunk upon his breast like one who is utterly crushed holmes stuck his feet up on the corner of the mantelpiece and leaning back with his hands in his pockets began talking rather to himself as it seemed than to us the man married a woman very much older than himself for her money said he and he enjoyed the use of the money of the daughter as long as she lived with them it was a considerable sum for people in their position and the loss of it would have made a serious difference it was worth an effort to preserve it the daughter was of a good amiable disposition but affectionate and warm-hearted in her ways so that it was evident that with her fair personal advantages and her little income she would not be allowed to remain single long now her marriage would mean of course the loss of a hundred a year so what does her stepfather do to prevent it he takes the obvious course of keeping her at home and forbidding her to seek the company of people her own age but soon he found that that would not answer for ever she became restive insisted upon her rights and finally announced her positive intention of going to a certain ball what does her clever stepfather do then he conceives an idea more creditable to his head than to his heart with the connivance and assistance of his wife he disguised himself covered those green eyes with tinted glasses masked the face with a moustache and a pair of bushy whiskers sunk that clear voice into an insinuating whisper and doubly secure on account of the girl's short sight he appears as mr hosmer angel and keeps off other lovers by making love himself it was only a joke at first groaned our visitor we never thought that she would have been so carried away very likely not however that may be the young lady was very decidedly carried away and having made up her mind that her stepfather was in france the suspicion of treachery never for an instant entered her mind she was flattered by the gentleman's attentions and the effect was increased by the loudly expressed admiration of her mother then mr angel began to call for it was obvious that the matter should be pushed as far as it would go if a real effect were to be produced there were meetings and an engagement which would finally secure the girl's affections from turning towards any one else but the deception could not be kept up for ever these pretended journeys to france were rather cumbrous the thing to do was clearly to bring the business to an end in such a dramatic manner that it would leave a permanent impression upon the young lady's mind and prevent her from looking upon any other suitor for some time to come 
hence those vows of fidelity exacted upon a testament and hence also the allusions to a possibility of something happening on the very morning of the wedding james windybank wished miss sutherland to be so bound to hosmer angel and so uncertain as to his fate that for ten years to come at any rate she would not listen to another man as far as the church door he brought her and then as he could go no farther he conveniently vanished away by the old trick of stepping in at one door of a four-wheeler and out at the other i think that that was the chain of events mr windybank our visitor had recovered something of his assurance while holmes had been talking and he rose from his chair now with a cold sneer upon his pale face it may be so or it may not mr holmes said he but if you are so very sharp you ought to be sharp enough to know that it is you who are breaking the law now and not me i have done nothing actionable from the first but as long as you keep that door locked you lay yourself open to an action for assault and illegal constraint the law cannot as you say touch you said holmes unlocking and throwing open the door yet there never was a man who deserved punishment more if the young lady has a brother or a friend he ought to lay a whip across your shoulders by jove he continued flushing up at the sight of the bitter sneer upon the man's face it is not part of my duties to my client but here's a hunting crop handy and i think i shall just treat myself to he took two swift steps to the whip but before he could grasp it there was a wide clatter of steps upon the stairs the heavy hall door banged and from the window we could see mr james windybank running at the top of his speed down the road there's a cold-blooded scoundrel said holmes laughing as he threw himself down into his chair once more that fellow will rise from crime to crime until he does something very bad and ends up on the gallows the case has in some respects been not entirely devoid of interest i cannot now entirely see all the steps of your reasoning i remarked well of course it was obvious from the first that this mr hosmer angel must have some strong object for his curious conduct and it was equally clear that the only man who had really profited by the incident as far as we could see was the stepfather then the fact that the two men were never together but that the one always appeared when the other was away was suggestive so were the tinted spectacles and the curious voice which both hinted at a disguise as did the bushy whiskers my suspicions were all confirmed by his peculiar action in typewriting his signature which of course inferred that his handwriting was so familiar to her that she would recognize even the smallest sample of it you see all these isolated facts together with many minor ones all pointed in the same direction and how did you verify them having once spotted my man it was easy to get corroboration i knew the firm for which this man worked having taken the printed description i i eliminated everything from it which could be the result of a disguise the whiskers the glasses the voice and i sent it to the firm with a request that they would inform me whether it answered to the description of any of their travellers i had already noticed the peculiarities of the typewriter and i wrote to the man himself at his business address asking him if he would come here as i expected his reply was typewritten and revealed the same trivial but characteristic defects the same post brought me a letter from westhouse and marbank of fenchurch street to say that the description tallied in every respect with that of their employee james windybank voila too and miss sutherland if i tell her she will not believe me you may remember the old persian saying there is danger from him who taketh the tiger cub and danger also for whosoever snatcheth a delusion from a woman there is as much sense in hafiz as in horace and as much knowledge of the world end of a case of identity by arthur conan doyle